House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy is looking to form a select committee on China if he's elected as Speaker of the House in the incoming Congress. For more on this and the latest out of Washington, D.C., let's bring in Yahoo Finance contributor Kevin Cirilli. Kevin, China, one of those issues that both parties are likely to see eye to eye on. What's the expectation here? Yes, uh, likely House Speaker Kevin McCarthy saying on the Sunday shows over the weekend of Fox News that he would establish a select committee on China. There's been a lot of questions about the partisanship and whether or not Republicans are, are going to investigate the administration and whatnot. But this is a really important policy, potentially bipartisan, that really could shape the U.S.-China uh, relationship for quite some time to come. Here's why. This is the same week that Vice President Kamala Harris is going, as she is overseas uh, in the Philippines, reiterating U.S. support in the uh, South China Sea. It comes as uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken visited there uh, and reiterated Kamala, uh, Vice President Harris's positions in August. It also comes as the Republicans in this Congress laid out in their China task force a series of China prescriptions economically, militarily, uh, as well as technologically in terms of the broader GOP platform for the U.S.-China relationship. So uh, you've got a lot of developments on the U.S.-China front. It, we should note uh, that Taiwan is holding local elections this week. And a key Democrat has emerged on this, Senator Mark Warner, uh, obviously chairman of the Intelligence Committee, uh, and a Democrat from Virginia, he spoke to Fox News over the weekend, and he said that on the issue of China-based company ByteDance's TikTok, that parents should be concerned. He actually went so far, Akiko, as to say, quote, Trump was right, end quote, when it comes to TikTok. So that's a, that's a key indicator of the bipartisanship when you've got a Democrat on Intel uh, saying that there's alignment between the former administration uh, and Democrats on these issues. Yeah, uh, TikTok slash ByteDance continue to be in the crosshairs of both parties. Uh, let's talk about something else uh, that developed over the weekend. A, a number of potential candidates for the Republican yeah. nomination uh, for presidency is kind of testing out their message over the weekend. Uh, certainly appears to show some challenges ahead for former President Trump after he announced his run. Well, look. You know, having covered uh, the first Trump presidential campaign uh, and the second, it's striking to see the similarities and the differences between his go around of it this time uh, versus the last two times. What's similar with this go, go around from 2016 is that there appears, keyword appears, to be a crowded Republican primary that benefited Trump in 2016. But the difference now, is the biggest difference, and that's similar to 2020, is that Trump now has a political record to run on. You know, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of so-called analysis uh, on Trump and the Murdochs, Trump and Elon Musk, which is essentially the same as Trump and the tweets. But the, the bigger play is that Trump this time is not running just a national campaign. This is a global campaign. And look no further than the Trump organization's business dealing uh, with Oman. Maggie Haberman of the New York Times reported just within the last day or so uh, that the Trump organization has struck a deal with the Saudis to build a $4 billion arrangement to build in Oman. Of course, Oman is where there is a key U.S. strategic military base. I say that because when you look at the policy, and I would really urge folks to look at the policy because the Abraham Accords were such a central component of the Trump geopolitical legacy. And when you have soon to be reinstated Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making a return to power, uh, and you have now significant relationships that the Trump world has in the Middle East at a time in which uh, the Israelis particularly are pressuring the Biden administration for how they're going to handle Iran, that to me seems to be where the focus at this particular mm. juncture should be as Trump gets ready to go for 2024. Uh, well, finally, let's shift our attention to the Supreme Court. We had these reports out over the weekend 
with the highest court facing another allegation of a breach, uh, essentially a leaked decision. Um, this one tracing all the way back to 2014. What can you tell us about that? And it sounds like Democrats are already asking for some kind of investigation. Well, it, it shouldn't just be Democrats asking for an investigation. I think you had Republicans asking for an investigation with the, the last leak. Look, this institution, the Supreme Court of the United States, is no different in terms of its exposure to breach risk and cyber risk than any other institution, be it government or in the private sector. And that's why civic tech is so crucially important in terms of safeguarding uh, institutions and uh, the private sector. So I think it's part of a broader trend of institutions that, and businesses for that matter, that are going to have to look and assess their risk in terms of safeguarding incredibly, not just market moving information as it relates to the private sector, but domestically uh, incredibly important decisions as we've seen from the Supreme Court. Civic tech is an emerging issue uh, that folks have been talking about for like a decade here in Washington, DC. But I can tell you uh, based on my fellowships, for example, that this is a key area uh, that folks are really focusing on um, for for the years ahead. Yeah, it uh, raises questions about the legitimacy again. Um, Kevin Cirilli, as always, appreciate your time.